Well, welcome everyone. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Kathy Blackwell and as president of the Board of Trustees of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society, I'm thrilled to welcome you to this month's Words, Writers, and Southwest Stories presentation. Before we begin, though, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the Southwest Seattle Historical Society and our beloved Log House Museum are located on the traditional lands of the Duwamish people, past and present. We are grateful here at the Historical Society to the Duwamish peoples, Seattle's first people, for stewarding this land throughout the generations. And I'd like to thank our sponsors tonight, For Culture, Luna Park Cafe, Home Street Bank, the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center, and the podcast, Always West Seattle. Their generosity makes these free experiences possible for all of us. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us. If you'd like to know more about the Log House Museum, which is the home of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society, there's a link in the chat feature. If you're joining us for the first time this evening, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for our question and answer session this evening. You can submit your question during the presentation as the questions come to you, and then our speaker will answer your questions at the end of his presentation. So now I'd like to welcome Dora Faye Hendricks, the chairman of the Historical Society's Words, Writers, and Southwest Stories, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Dora Faye. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy, and thank all of you for being with us tonight. We're always happy to welcome new people. I have never met our guest tonight until we saw him on screen. And as you probably have read from the publicity distributed for the past several weeks, our presenter tonight is Peter Blecka, an author, historian, researcher, independent curator. He's also a staff historian and contributing editor with Washington State's online encyclopedia, historylink.org. And the multiple award-winning author of something like 10 books, Peter is also director of the Northwest Music Archives and a freelance writer. Tonight, he'll be presenting his latest book and vintage images of lost road houses of Seattle. In addition to all that, Peter has been acknowledged as the, quote, premier expert in his chosen field of research, says Seattle Weekly. Another quote, Seattle's best known collector from Scram Magazine and a writer who, quote, deserves a place in Northwest music history from Seattle Post Intelligence. As a music historian, Peter has researched the Northwest music for over two decades. As a senior curator with Seattle's Experience Music Project, known as EMP, he developed such exhibits as the Northwest Passage Local History Gallery and the Jimi Hendrix Gallery. Because I am so impressed by the musical history Peter has helped create, I'm sharing this list of uh, other books that he has written, and they have nothing to do, I guess, with the book he's presenting tonight, but I want you to know about it. it was new to me. Taboo Tunes is one that I bought just recently when I read this, Peter, um, and I'm enjoying that because of the controversial nature of what's taboo and what isn't. Um, Sonic Boom, The History of Northwest Rock, from Louie Louie to Smells Like Teen Spirit. Another book is Chateau St. Michel, The First 50 Years, Stomp and Shout, R&B and the Origins of Northwest Rock and Roll, Rising Tides and Tailwinds, The Story of the Fort of Seattle, Rock and Roll Archaeologist, How I Chased Down Kurt Stratocaster's The Layla Guitar and Janice's Boa, and Music in Washington, Seattle and Beyond 2007. Peter was born in Seattle and fairly recently has returned to our area. We're glad he did. Peter, tell us and show us about the Lost Roadhouses of Seattle. Let's do that. Thank you for that way too long introduction. <laughs> uh, uh, one little correction there. I'm not a recent returnee to Seattle. I was born here and have been here for most of my 66 years. So 
uh, with that one little correction, I'll just uh, thank the Southwest uh, Seattle Historical Society for inviting me and thank everybody who's uh, Zooming with us here this evening. We are here to talk about Lost Roadhouses. Uh, this is a book that my co-author uh, Brad Holden and I uh, started writing about a year and a half ago. And um, uh, his, as some of you might recognize his name, he's probably the preeminent uh, historian of prohibition history in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, as you can tell from my introduction, my focus has been on music history. But when we met, we decided we should probably collaborate on on a topic that uh, overlaps both of our interests, and that is these lost roadhouses. Uh, I was fascinated by the music history that uh, is embodied in these old roadhouses, all the musical activity that happened there, and he was keenly interested in the uh, prohibition activities. Uh, so that's the beginnings of this project. Um, now we're gonna get into Lost Roadhouses uh, in a moment, but I'll just say that uh, so there are several sub themes throughout the book and some of them we'll touch on here this evening. Uh, besides the roadhouses, uh, we'll be looking at dance halls, speakeasies, moonshiners, liquor smugglers, gangsters, corrupt cops, gambling halls, reefer dens and brothels. So hopefully everybody will have a little bit of fun here tonight. Uh, the other two, Subtopics that are important to this whole story are early car culture, what happened when automobiles first arrived in the Northwest, and again, the Prohibition era, uh, when the roadhouses multiplied uh, exponentially, basically. Once people got in their cars, people started building more roadhouses. So that's sort of what happened. Uh, these roadhouses exist, uh, existed in a wide variety of forms, ranging from barns like the Evergreen Ballroom to backwood shacks like this jungle temple. Uh, some of the others were just uh, novel roadside attractions like this one down by Des Moines, uh, Washington. And uh, they range from barns to uh, elaborate structures with architecture uh, evoking Spanish castles or Chinese palaces, as we'll see in a few minutes. Um, uh, but before we dive into all the roadhouses, let's just talk for a moment about the roads that they were on. Can't have roadhouses without roads. And the fact of the matter is, is that Seattle, believe it or not, for the first eight years after it was settled by the Denny Party in 1852, there were no roads leading into or out of Seattle. Nothing going north, nothing going south, nothing going east. Um, but that village of Seattle uh, finally saw some hope when the uh, territorial legislature uh, came up with funding. And the goal was to build a road from Stort Fort Stillicum down by Tacoma mm -hmm. all the way up to Fort Whatcom yeah. up by Bellingham. And it was going to cut right through Seattle, basically along First Avenue. Um, but uh, that funding came through in 1858. And um, yes, in 58, and they started building the road. They started building it south from First and Yesler down uh, to past Tacoma to Stillicum, to the fort down there. And it was called the Military Telegraph Road. Here's an actual photograph of it, of part of it. This was a part that was near uh, Beacon Hill. Um, prior to this road, any transportation in or out of Seattle was done by ship, by canoe, or by walking on forest paths. So uh, some people actually arrived in Seattle walking up the beaches from Olympia, uh, where they basically had come from Portland after they crossed the Oregon Trail and things like that. Uh, here is Front Street, First Avenue, basically, looking south. Um, and, you know, this is long before automobiles. It's all horses and wagons. Um, so this road was completed in 1860. Seattle now had a road that went south. Uh, it took many more years for the one to be completed going north through Everett to Bellingham. But uh, what didn't take any time at all is for the first roadhouse saloon brothel to show up. And that was one year after, after this military telegraph road uh, was completed in 1860. So it was in 1861 and uh, and it was uh, founded by a, a businessman from San Francisco uh, who came up here, uh, John Pinnell was his name, and he opened, to the chagrin of many of the fine citizens of the town, he opened the first saloon right there at First Avenue and just a little bit south, a little bit south of Yesler on First Avenue on this new road. 
Um, and it was called the Illahi. It was a Chinook trading jargon word. Um, but uh, I think there might have been a tavern or a saloon or two prior <laughs> to him. But he gets credit for creating the first saloon that had live music for dancing in the evenings and also had a brothel upstairs. So uh, he brought a musical trio up from San Francisco and that was the first band that was uh, that provided uh, nightly dancing opportunities for the people in this small village. Um, so the story of this, of this place, the Illahi, uh, sort of had an interesting existence and also an interesting ending in that uh, the townsfolk did not really appreciate the noise and the crime and everything that uh, was occurring around this uh, saloon brothel. Um, and they, the citizens sort of rose up a little bit. And so the city leaders, uh, you know, started having talks with Mr. Pinnell about his place. And they came to a solution, which was that he would bribe the city with like a thousand dollars a year if they would not try and squeeze him out of the town. So one historical thing that's happening there is he's beginning the tradition of corruption, corrupting city hall, really corrupting the, the law enforcement. Uh, and that, of course, is a theme for the next uh, many decades after. Um, uh, the end of the Illahi story is also uh, sort of telling in that it did catch fire one night. And to not a lot of people's surprise, nobody, none of the citizenry lifted a finger. Nobody brought buckets of water. The fire, depart fire department stood by and just watched it burn. Almost everybody in the town was glad to see it go. So that is another sub-theme that's going to reoccur throughout this uh, presentation because Brad Holden, my co-author, and I have basically estimated that about 40% of all the notable roadhouses that, uh, that we've documented in the book ended up burning one way or the other, arson or maybe an insurance claim or, uh, you know, rival gangsters from across town. Uh, we don't know the reason for many of them, but it's a theme. So... Uh, by 1890, this village, the Pioneer Square neighborhood, basically, of downtown Seattle, uh, by 1890, it had started to earn its reputation, or it continued uh, expanding its reputation as a rough and rowdy nightlife center, uh, which Pioneer Square has held on to that reputation forever, basically. Uh, but it started in 1890, and it was around that time that uh, a couple interesting saloon keepers showed up in town and opened up their own uh, saloons and brothels and gambling dens. Uh, one of them was Wyatt Earp, the famous gunslinger from the OK Corral in the Southwest. He showed up and, and built a saloon at uh, Second and uh, I think Occidental on a corner there down in Pioneer Square. The other person to show up in town in 1890s to open up a, a saloon and brothel was none other than the grandfather of Donald Trump. So, uh, so that's how it went for the next decade or so. It was getting wilder down there, rougher down there in that neighborhood. And um, But exactly one decade later, it's now 1900, the year of 1900, that is when the first automobile drove into Seattle. Uh, it, uh, it had been driven across country by a Chicago businessman. He showed it off in San Francisco. He showed it off in Portland. He showed it off in Tacoma. And then he brought it up to Seattle and pretty much impressed everybody. There was all sorts of newspaper coverage of, wow, this automobile is putting around town. And again, what's important to us about that is that over the next uh, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, uh, there became hundreds of people imported cars, brought cars, had, had them shipped up here, then thousands, uh, and thus began car culture, where people suddenly didn't have to hitch up a horse in a wagon or jump on a horse and ride out somewhere. Uh, they could uh, go tooling around in their new automobiles and uh, it created political pr pressure for more roads. People wanted more roads and more roads were funded. Um, one of those roads, again, heading south of Seattle there, it was, uh, uh, it was down around Georgetown, actually down by the Boeing Field where the first roadhouse to catch the unwanted attentions of the law uh, was founded down there. And it was Clancy's Roadhouse. Oops, I'm behind a little bit. Here's our picture of a couple guys enjoying a belt of whiskey on the, uh, on the road near Seattle with their old automobile. 
So Clancy's Roadhouse, it was 1915. This is one year before prohibition even began. Uh, but what happened was John E. Clancy opened this place up and uh, it was only open from uh, midnight till 3 a.m. in the morning. That was the hours of operation. So you get an idea of what kind of people might want to go down there and party. Um, again, it was located about where Boeing Field is, south of Georgetown there. Uh, and the local sheriff, whose name was uh, Sheriff Cudahy at that time, he was hearing wild stories about what was going on out there. So he uh, took a bunch of his uh, deputies and they went and uh, raided the place. They raided it twice without catching the uh, management serving liquor. What they discovered was people were showing up in their cars and they kept their liquor in the trunk of the car, drank, and then went in and partied and danced and did whatever. Uh, here we're seeing the Seattle Star newspaper of that time. Uh, and this was them sort of celebrating that uh, Sheriff Cudahy and his five deputies had staked out the joint one more time. This is the third time they had done it. Uh, this time they raided it. And uh, here's what the newspaper had to say about it. Speaking of the uh, speaking of the sheriff and his deputies, it said they watched auto after auto unload guests between midnight and 3 a.m. The piano worked overtime. The dancers never let up. It was one merry trot after another, and the booze flowed merrily. So, uh, in the end, 21 people were arrested. This time, they caught the place uh, selling illicit liquor. Again, this is a year before alcohol has even, uh, you know, faced prohibition. So this is just too rowdy of a joint uh, for the upstanding people of Seattle to put up with. Um, the, we see from the headlines there, girls caught in the raid, Clancy's dancers arrested. I have my doubts about the word dancers there. I think that might've been a euphemism for another occupation, uh, but the newspapers were being polite at the time. So uh, time went on, as everybody knows, this unpopular prohibition law drove all sorts of crime. Pro prohibition itself bred corruption, organized crime, gangland violence, and a general disrespect for the law. Uh, you had your moonshiners. Here's some handsome moonshiners from the Northwest showing off their gear. And um, uh, so some of these guys created the entire new careers as bootleggers making whiskey for sale. Other guys, got wealthy from uh, running a smuggling operation from uh, Canada down to this area. The boss of the crime gang was a uh, uh, police department lieutenant gone bad, Roy Olmsted. Uh, he became the king of the local smugglers. He ran a gang that snuck uh, illicit Canadian booze here uh, on a fleet of specially built speedboats. And he had another fleet of trucks um, and it was eventually discovered that the uh, so-called children's nighttime story hour on, uh, on a local radio station was actually uh, his radio station. It was run out of his home in the Mount Baker neighborhood. His wife, Olmsted's wife, was the uh, announcer on the radio show, and it was finally determined that her nighttime storytelling for kids was actually sending out coded messages to those boats out in Puget Sound and to the truck drivers. She was tipping them off to what beach it was safe to uh, rendezvous on for the offloading. So the boats would be loaded with booze. They would land on whatever beach, Muckle Teo, uh, probably Fauntleroy for all I know, uh, maybe Alki Point, I don't know. But then the trucks would arrive and his gang would load up and start distributing it. Among Roy Olmsted's uh, biggest clients buying the booze from him happened to be the hotel butler uh, at Second and James. The bottom half of that building is still there on the corner. It's just a parking garage uh, now, basically. Um, but uh, the Butler Hotel would be uh, the site of many liquor raids over the decades. But it was the same pattern. It would be padlocked. Its managers would be taken to court. They would pay their fines. They would sit aside for a few days or a few weeks, and then they'd be back in business. There was just no real effort to uh, put them out of business entirely. Uh, and that's because it was Seattle's grand uh, hotel uh, and prominent people like to go there and drink. And the music was good. The music, oh, here's an example of them being raided. 17 men, women, uh, they were gambling. Uh, it was college night, it says there at the bottom. 
when all these people were arrested. There were many, many raids. They were all splashed in the newspaper headlines of the day. But uh, the attraction again there, besides the booze, was the music. This was Seattle's finest dance band of that era, Vic Myers Hotel Butler Band. Uh, they played all the snappy tunes that the collegiate crowd liked, uh, the flappers and the young men in their raccoon coats. And, and uh, um, a couple of interesting things about this band are that Vic Myers and his orchestra were the very first band in the Northwest to be recorded, to have a record released. And that happened when one of the major labels, Brunswick Records, based out of New York, sent a field crew out to the West Coast to find bands, to discover unknown bands, and they ended up recording Vic Myers and his orchestra at the uh, Hotel Butler. Uh, that was 1923. It led to a long career for Vic Myers. Him, him and his band issued many, many records. <laughs> and um, the other trick that Vic Myers used to do is he would be up on the top floor in the Rose Room playing for these dancers and these people partying up there. And there was a signal they had from the guy down at the door down on the street and when the uh, liquor patrol, when the cops would come, he would push a button and ring a bell up on the bandstand. And that would clue Vic Myers into stopping his band for a minute and shifting to a new song that would clue everybody into what was going on. And the song that they would then switch to was How Dry I Am. So at that point, everybody attending would dump their drinks on the floor, kick the bottles over, and the raid would happen, and very few people would be taken to jail because they were not caught with liquor in their hands. So that was, uh, that was the trick. Uh, but the raids went on. Here's the new sheriff in town. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the county sheriff. This is Matt Starwich uh, showing off that he had confiscated some booze somewhere, and he's gonna break every single one of those bottles. Um, in addition to uh, the hotel butler uh, as a client for Roy Olmsted's gang's smuggling of this liquor, the other was this fellow, John Henry Doc Hamilton. He was probably the most famous and actually beloved speakeasy operators in Seattle. Uh, he was a World War I veteran. He came to Seattle after serving in France. Uh, the first time he got busted was in 1923 at a speakeasy. He ran out of his tiny little apartment on Olive Street. And it was in the papers and he got a minor fine, not enough of a financial burden to get him out of the business because he saw what the profit margin was. So uh, the next thing you know, he opened up this place. This is one of the buildings, the very few buildings that's still standing in Seattle that was a speakeasy. It's up there on Capitol Hill. Uh, it's uh, been a uh, pizza parlor for the college kids up there. Uh, I think it's been an Indian restaurant. It's been an ice cream shop. It's still, it's still active. I'm not quite sure off the top of my uh, brain here of what it is exactly at the moment, but it's a cool building that uh, is still there. Hamilton's Barbecue Pit. It was also called the 908 Club. It's at 908 12th Avenue. You can Google map that. Um, Ninth and Madison. The place was glamorous. Hamilton himself was charming and refined and elegant. He served as the greeter. He also sang with a quartet to entertain people. And he made sure that his kitchen was cooking up Southern cuisine, um, which a lot of people were uh, interested in that. There was lots of newcomers here who were homesick for Southern cuisine. Um, the booze evidently float freely because the place was raided all the time. Uh, the music that they were entertained by up there, uh, in addition to Hamilton's own vocal quartet, was provided by Oscar Holden, who was known as the patriarch of Seattle jazz. Um, he uh, was one of the greatest musicians of that whole era, of the teens and 20s and the 30s. He arrived in town, actually, I think in 1919, in a small band with uh, Jelly Roll Morton. Some of you may recognize that name. He was... Uh, one of the most famous ragtime pianists of that whole time, and uh, he, he's the self-proclaimed inventor of jazz. So those two guys showed up in town together, and uh, Jelly Roll Morton ended up heading out of town. Oscar Holden stayed, and uh, we were very grateful for that because he ended up having five kids who each and every one of them ended up being uh, pioneers in Seattle's rhythm and blues and rock and roll scenes. Uh, one of them being Ron Holden, uh, who had the most success of any of those kids. He had a top 10 international 
uh, hit in 1960 called Love You So. So, uh, uh, but all those kids ended up being important uh, in the music scene here. Uh, and Hamilton himself uh, was so popular uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, is this uh, joint, the 908 12th, the 908 Club um, was just so classy that, uh, that uh, even the city's mayor chose to drink there. I think that city council people chose to drink there. And for all we know, you know, members of the police department drank there. Um, but again, I got busted many times. But along the way, Doc Hamilton became a folk hero of sorts here because uh, every time he got busted and had to close down, he would soon reopen again. And part of this was just due to his personality, his winsome ways. Uh, uh, the newspapers were crazy about him. Uh, they covered all of his, all of his hearings in the courts, uh, all of his trials. Uh, he was just cheerful and he won the public's heart. He would do things like pretend to snore while he was being prosecuted to sleep there on the bench. He would, uh, uh, he would arrive at court uh, with sandwiches for everybody in the room. He just had all sorts of stunts that he did. And, and uh, again, it made him a sort of a folk hero around town. Um, but over time, meaning over decades, the law was getting tougher. Uh, and uh, it was 1916 when prohibition was uh, launched in Washington. We were one of the early states to do it. It took four more years for prohibition to go national. It wasn't until 1920 that prohibition went na national, but uh, we had a hard head start here. And, um, and what happened was the various levels of law enforcement kind of uh, started pushing pre putting pressure on these successful speakeasy operators in town and started uh, hammering them a bit, putting the thumb on them a little bit more. And at some point it became clear to them that they needed to get out of town. They needed to get out of downtown and uh, move up, move past the city limits, either south or north. Um, there were these new highways being built and, uh, and uh, Doc Hamilton was one of the guys, one of the first guys to relocate and move north of Seattle, um, just past the uh, city limit up there. Uh, one of the other joints that uh, followed him up in that direction uh, had a slogan back in those days that's kind of telling. It was, our fun begins where the city limits end. So uh, now I'm going to split off here into two different, two more sections of, of the presentation because I need to focus geographically. When we finally got a couple roads that went north out of Seattle, there was one that went straight up basically today's Highway 99, Aurora Avenue. It was the old, uh, it was called the old Seattle Everett Highway. We'll get to that in a minute. But the earlier one was uh, the one that we think of as uh, Lake City Way now, the old Bothell Highway. And, uh, and at, uh, when it first was built, uh, that, that uh, northbound route, um, Lake City Way, the, the old, Bothell Highway was initially just a muddy wagon road that had been carved out of the forest by a logger businessman who wanted to get his logs uh, to Yesler Sawmill on Seattle's waterfront. Um, it was not an official road. That was some, like a private road. He and his team did that, but it was a dangerous, dark, unlit route that had 14 sharp curves and four bridges. Um, eventually, when the automobile age arrived that was just untenable. There were countless car wrecks, people going to and from uh, some of these new roadhouses out there. Um, but it was the road that went north. It actually went up to uh, Kenmore, Bothell area, and then uh, sort of turned uh, northwest and over to Everett. So that was the initial way to get to Everett. Um, so let's talk about that, the old Bothell Highway. In doing the research for this book, the thing that was uh, astounding to me was the, well, I'm getting behind on my slides here. Sorry about that. There's Oscar Holden, our patriarch of jazz, the uh, ragtime boogie woogie master from the 1920s and 30s. Here is a newspaper showing you that uh, all of these roadhouses are open and ready for you to drive on up. Uh, there's just so many of them there, Dixie Inn, Mammy Shack, The Eagle, uh, and it is that sheer number of them that I found to be astounding. There were more than that. Let's read a few more here. Uh, in addition to Doc Hamilton's ranch, 
There was the Bluebird, the Canyon Park Inn, the Eagle Inn, the Green Mill, the Lake View, May's Place, and my old southern home. Heading north, uh, further north, uh, or heading north from the city limits at Northeast 85th, let's take them sort of uh, geographically. You had the Cotton Club at 85th, you had the Jolly Roger at 87th, Mac Shanty at 90th, that is one of the three or four of these old road houses that still exist. That's where we actually had our book release party a few months back. You had the Black Cat, we see it up there on the hill, which is now a uh, uh, Bill Pierre uh, auto, <laughs> auto lot. Um, the Black Cat, it was a particularly troublesome spot. There was the time in 1923 when the Seattle Times sent a couple undercover reporters out to go check out what's going on up here on the Bothell Highway. And they went up there and they took notes and uh, they went to, I think it was five or seven different uh, road houses. And the next day or the day after there was front page news here, these night owl reporters went to these road houses and they had plenty to report. There was, uh, everything was going on. They could see that booze was flowing and, and uh, just, you know, everything that would shock the, uh, shock the public. And uh, that would lead to more pressure on the police and onto the liquor agents that, uh, hey, this is all going on and you're not really doing enough to stop it. Um, one of those that was up there at the time was the Grove. And we see there's Carol's famous dance orchestra. It's on the new Bothell Highway, they're calling for it. Uh, the bottom line there on that graphic image of this advertisement uh, is kind of interesting. Many of these places didn't have and never did get street addresses. They would say things like, look for the blue light, or eight miles north, or half a mile north uh, uh, after the third bend in the road, just things like that. So, um, you know, Google map or, you know, having a GPS in your car or anything wasn't going to help, help you get there or get back home safely. Um, the Grove was another trouble spot, though. Blue, booze blamed for killing. This was unfortunate for the, uh, for the Grove. Uh, it, again, was a really popular spot. But what happened one night here was that a woman hanging out with her friends at a table drinking decided to reach into her purse and pull out her pistol and show it off. And it managed to managed to go off, and sadly to say, it hit the groom across the room who was sitting there enjoying a quiet evening with his bride. So this outraged the whole town. There was weeks and months of screaming headlines about this thing, and uh, basically ended to the uh, closing of the of the Grove in time. Uh, I think it reopened under another name, under new management, a while later. But this one just shocked the whole town. New Year's Eve of 1926 uh, saw one of the biggest crackdowns there ever was. This is when King County Sheriff Claude Bannock and his deputies uh, made their way up there and busted seven different roadhouses in one night. They included Doc Hamilton's Barbecue Ranch, the Jungle Temple, the Camel Inn, the Orient Inn, Otto's Place, the Tip Top Inn, and the Toot Inn. Uh, there were so many of them, so many people arrested that the next day when Sheriff Bannock did a press conference about this, he came up with a clever phrase and he called the Bothell Highway the Bottle Highway. And its bad reputation continued to increase. Uh, you had other daring businessmen, like Mr. Uh, Willard here, who decided to open up a really elaborate uh, uh, suburban dancing palace up on the new Bothell Highway, but uh, Mind you, it's not a roadhouse. It's something else. Don't tell him it's a roadhouse. It has Tex Howard's orchestra. It has private dining rooms. It has the largest dance floor in the West, but do not call it a roadhouse. Uh, the problem was that everybody <laughs> knew that it was a roadhouse and people would either bring their own booze or find ways of getting their booze. But uh, this was at 89th. Uh, on a corner of today's Lake City Way, uh, where there's a public storage, nondescript brown building sitting there now. Uh, but 
community, the neighborhood people, somebody did not like this place because it was a roadhouse and it was burned in an act of arson uh, in 1933, right before prohibition ended. Other roadhouses along this er in this area were the Lockhart Inn, no address given. It just says, look for the blue rooster. See the little blue rooster at the top there? That's what you gotta look for. Um, again, the Jungle Temple here, New Orleans Chicken Gumbo and Jungle Rice. You got Hal Bellis and his Jungle Temple Orchestra, uh, two miles north of the city limits on the Bothell Highway. And this is one of the uh, other notable raids that happened. Um, it, uh, as it says there, uh, the sheriff and his deputies mixed it up with the lively, in a lively free-for-all rough and tumble fight with the uh, patrons. And it said that uh, the combatants emerged with more or less tattered clothing, bruised ears, and battered skulls. So evidently the people who were partying weren't going to uh, give in that easy to the law enforcement officers. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? The next one was just a few blocks up, up at 137th, and that was the Rebels Inn. Another one was the Plantation, pretty rustic looking at 145th. The Briarcrest Lodge was one of the early ones. It started, it started as a place where you rented horses to ride, and you could spend the night and you could have dinner, but they also, uh, it's sort of a unique place in that it had a outdoor dancing pavilion with a wooden floor just out on the grounds. So that actually sounds kind of fun to me. Uh, in addition to that, going into the Kenmore area, there were other ones, the ship uh, at 61st Northeast, the Blind Pig at 67th Northeast, uh, Hitzman's Dance Hall at 68th, and Mammy's Shack at 76th. Uh, there was another interesting one though, Dick Parker's New Bothell Highway Pavilion. This was a great discovery for me because I, like many fans of early Northwest rock, are fully familiar with the fact that Dick Parker had a ballroom up on Aurora. It ran from the 1930s all the way up until, I don't know, 15 years ago, but it was uh, one of the great dance halls. I don't think any of us knew that Dick Parker had an earlier one on the Bothell Highway, but he did. He opened the first one on the Bothell Highway, he ended up selling it after four or five years. Then he moved over to the old Everett, Seattle Everett Highway, or Highway 99, Aurora Avenue, and built the second one. Uh, here was the band, the first band that he had. Uh, I don't think they made any records, but they it looked like they would have played some toe tap and dance tunes to me. Here's the Parkers over on Aurora. This was opened in 1931. Uh, it had, in my, I'm sorry, 1930, it had, in my opinion, one of the uh, best and richest uh, histories of any of these dance halls in that it started with big dance bands, um, including those uh, led by Tommy Dorsey, Guy Lombardo, um, and, as, and more. And then as the rock uh, era began in the 1950s, everyone from Jerry Lee Lewis to Gene Vincent, Bobby Darren, uh, all those kind of guys came through and played there. It was about that time, 1959 or so, when the, uh, the Pacific Northwest hatched its first generation of uh, rhythm and blues and rock and roll bands. And uh, they basically all got to play this place, uh, including the Fleetwoods, the Frannics, the Viceroys, the Dynamics, who recorded their famous Live at Parker's Ballroom album. Uh, the Kingsman played Louie Louie up there. Paul Revere and the Raiders played there. Dawn and the Good Times. Uh, Seattle Sweetheart Merrily Rush played there. Uh, the Sonics played there uh, in the 70s. Uh, it turned into uh, more of a hippie joint um, called the Aquarius Tavern, and uh, many, many, many more bands played there, and it was uh, really the place where the great Seattle band that started in the 70s, Heart, uh, got their start and played there often. Um, but again, sad to say, it was raised in uh, bulldozed in November 2012, because Seattle needed one more car lot. Um, since I've gotten us over to Aurora now, the old Seattle Everett Highway, let's continue on there and look at a few more uh, of the dance halls and uh, roadhouses uh, that existed along that strip. 
oh, there's Parker's, there's Merrill Lee Rush. That's uh, later on. It looks like that's late 60s, 70s. Uh, surprising myself with where some of these slides are. Guess I'm a little rusty on this. Um, but going back in time now, here we see uh, Duffy's Roadhouse. Uh, this is one of the first ones. Uh, Duffy's Roadhouse was at 155th. It was not on Highway 99. It was a few blocks over. It was on the Golf Club Road. And I'm going to challenge anyone out there to tell me if they know where the Golf Club Road was. I wish I could see you and see you raising your hands and stuff, but I can't. So I'll just tell you Golf Club Road is Greenwood Avenue. But back then, I think this is 1912 or 1915, uh, the only thing up there was a, was this uh, large golf uh, course. So the road got named after it. This building still stands, but it's a private residence. Here's the Everstate Club. Again, up in that area, but not quite on Highway 99. This was over on Fremont and 122nd. Uh, but it was a dance hall that uh, had, uh, I think it started as a private club. And um, it had its problems with uh, neighbors complaining about the noise from the dancing and the music and the parking lot fun that was going on. Uh, here's two different advertisements for the China Land. Um, which was founded by the original cook over at the Jolly Roger, which we looked at earlier. He left, uh, he left uh, the Bothell Highway and, all, and came over here to Aurora. And uh, so these are from his grand opening. Um, and that building, that site also started as a horse riding ranch. Come and rent a horse, have dinner, have some drinks, do some dancing. Get ready for the liquor raid to happen. Um, and that building sort of still stands. If you cruise up and down Aurora at all on your way to Everett or anything, the drift on in is still there. And that is the site. Not much of the build, original building is left, but at least it's carrying on its tradition of uh, being sort of a gambling den. Here is Rubinax. This was at 185th. Here's Melby's Tavern. This is one of the favorite stories of my co-author, Brad Holden. Uh, he got to tour this building, which still stands. Uh, it's now Woody's Tavern. It's a triangular building you cannot miss when you're at 195th. Uh, Brad got to go inside and see the secret passageway. The, uh, behind the bar, there's a uh, sort of a hatch on the floor wooden hatch from the old days that if you lift it up, then there's a stairway down. And the story goes that that is where they hid the uh, illicit liquor during the, during the prohibition days. The Maryland Inn, that was at 212th. Um, there is still something on that corner. It's an entirely different building, but it, again, this is one of these chicken dinner joints that uh, also managed to provide illicit liquor if that's what you needed. Old Doc Hamilton. So now we met him downtown Seattle there, uh, and then he got kicked out and had to move out to the Bothell Highway. And then he thought he would expand, so he opened up this very large roadhouse dance hall, restaurant, barbecue joint at uh, 220th. Uh, but by this time there, I mean, he's got his face out on the sign by the road there with his name emblazoned on the big old sign. And it just did not take the law very long to figure out that uh, this is the Doc Hamilton from downtown that kept getting busted. And, and they basically uh, drove him out of business. I think he only lasted here six months before he sold it to his manager, uh, Mr. Owen, who then proceeded to build an empire of roadhouses up on, on the same highway, ended up owning, I think, four or five of them. And um, he became the new boss of the whole scene up there. And the law didn't leave him alone either. They kept harassing him, but he still managed to always keep one or two. Uh, he was juggling them <laughs> over and over again, running all these multiple businesses. I, if I remember correctly, I think that he, Mr. Owen, was eventually killed by a drunk driver out on the highway. And Mackenzie's Bungalow Inn, we're winding down now. This one is kind of interesting. It was at 228. Um, it was a round building. 
It had, I think, uh, a dozen or so individual pie-shaped rooms. Each room had windows out to the outside. Each room had a fireplace. Each room had its own, uh, uh, no, fireplace and windows out. And then uh, waitresses would come in and serve the private parties in those rooms. And uh, the other inter interesting thing is it was way ahead of its time. It had a glass ceiling. So people could do some stargazing while they were in there partying. Um, this really, I'm sorry to say, was another place that uh, after it got busted, after the owner got in trouble, uh, he'd only been away about a week. I don't know if he even got through his trial yet or not uh, when the place burned down. So people have speculated that could have been an insurance thing or that it was just, uh, uh, you know, competing gangsters down the road or just uh, irked neighbors that just didn't want any more of this happening, but the darn place burned. And then came 19... Uh, 38, when a fellow named Henry M. Jackson uh, became the county uh, district attorney prosecutor, and he took it on as a uh, personal quest to get rid of all of this illicit activity along that road, the old Seattle Everett Highway. Uh, and he would actually go along on the raids with the law enforcement officers, and he put the hammer on those guys. And basically, as it says there in this uh, uh advertisement that he drove them out of Snohomish County, and he sure did. He uh, basically uh, built his reputation by being a tough prosecuting attorney, and of course he then became a congressman, and then he was a longtime uh, preeminent uh, senator from Washington State for many, many years. Um, even though he did all that, the action didn't stop, but uh, because uh, people still like to have fun and, and uh, bend rules and break rules and stuff. Uh, meantime, uh, the Washington State's liquor laws began changing. Um, they began easing up a little bit. Uh, it was in 1940. It had been a while. It, 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 for a while, it had been a case of uh, these, some of these clubs turned into bottle clubs. That meant you, the patron, showed up with your own bottle of liquor in a paper bag. You set it down on the floor under your table, and you paid the house to bring you a setup. That was glasses, a bucket of ice, and maybe some mix or some soda or, or uh, ginger ale or whatever it was. And then you mixed your own drinks at the table. And that went on and on and on for quite a long time. Finally, in 1948, the laws changed again and made us that bars with a license could now start selling cocktails. Prior to that, nobody had been able to sell cocktails since before Prohibition. Uh, uh, times kept changing. It was in 1968 that the uh, laws eased up a little bit more. And then suddenly after 1968, a woman, females, could go to a bar solo. Prior to that, not so much. Prior to that 1968 liberalization, you couldn't walk around in a bar with a drink in the hand. You had to set the drink down and then walk around. So, um, so you know, it's this ever, ever evolving set of uh, tangled rules that uh, that uh, partiers and uh, owners of these establishments had to work around. And I guess from all this uh, roadhouse history, we can kind of see that we've traveled a, quite a long way down this road and and uh, we have arrived where we are today. And that's my presentation. I'd be happy to take questions if anybody has any. There are a handful of questions waiting for you. Would you like me to read them to you? That'd or be great. Do, you, do you want to read it? Sure. Um, and a couple of us were having problems uh, finding a place to write them. So I don't know. I didn't find a place to write it. Neither could Kathy. But the questions came in. The first one asked, how did Pioneer Square get its name? Well, you know that little triangular park there with the totem pole? Uh, all three sides of that were uh, land owned by the by, by the founders of the town. Henry Yesler, who owned the sawmill right there, uh, he basically owned both sides, the west and east side of that park. And uh, and uh, Doc Maynard, one of the other characters from the area, um, and, and then Yesler owned basically what became Yesler Way, Yesler Street. Uh, that went down to the waterfront where his sawmill was and where his cookhouse was. And uh, a couple of the other 
uh, pioneers owned the land all around it. So they, because those roads met in such a weird way that it formed that triangular space in the middle, they made a park out of it and they named it Pioneer Place. Uh, but the buildings next to it, you know, one is called the, Bion the Pioneer Building and the other one's the Pioneer Something. So it was all about pioneers at that point. Thank you. Um... Olmsted, with his illegal background, why is his name not on anything in the city? Well, I don't know that. Um, what I can clarify is that he is no relation to the Olmsted brothers who designed all of our great parks, Volunteer Park and, you know, uh, the University of Washington campus and I think even Green Lake Park and, you know, Lake Washington Boulevard, a lot of that stuff, the Olmsted brothers from New York uh, as designers and architects they designed. He's not related to them. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I'm not quite sure what kind of memorials should be put up to him. Uh, he wasn't a honest and great, uh, you know, uh, law enforcement officer. He was corrupt. So I'm not quite sure where <laughs> or what kind of uh, monument should be put up for him. Interesting. Thank you. Um, Patrick, tells us that 908 12th Avenue in Seattle is now the Chieftain Irish Pub and Restaurant. Hi, that sounds like a good place for a mug of Guinness then. Thank you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's basically been through every iteration, an Italian pizza joint and a Thai restaurant and an Indian restaurant. So it's time the Irish get there moment. That's good, thank you. Um, Andrea says, I've been here going on 40 years, but I was stunned when at how little the city respected its architectural history. What are your thoughts? Oh, you're gonna make me cry now. Uh, you know, half my favorite buildings have been knocked down in the last 15 years. So, um, you know, as you may know, the awareness of the historical importance of this stuff didn't even begin in this town until about 1965. The developers were already knocking down all sorts of historic red brick buildings in the Pioneer Square neighborhood. And finally, the city, the, the, the community arose and uh, demanded a stop to it. And that led to that neighborhood, at least from what was left, which is still quite a bit uh, of the old buildings. Um, they made it a, uh, an official historic district and that sort of limited what could be destroyed and knocked down anymore. But yeah, uh, Belltown, none of us recognize anymore. And by the way, Belltown, according to one of the uh, notable jazz musicians here from the 1930s, testified that his quote was, every other doorway in Belltown was a speakeasy in, during Prohibition. So uh, Brad and I are thinking of doing a volume two of this book because we missed some neighborhoods and we're still learning about roadhouses we didn't know about. And some people attending our book events have been bringing us photographs of roadhouses. So, uh, you know, we might need to look a little more into West Seattle roadhouse history and Belltown, and, and uh, this could lead to a volume two of the book. That's interesting. You know, I have a question. Uh, the Historical Society, of course, has been involved and will always be, I think, in preservation. So how early did we start um, having committees or organizations to watch for those issues? Well, that was sort of the result of this uh, thing that began in 1965. Yeah. That whole movement to preserve some of this stuff began because uh, Bill Spidell uh, launched the underground tour in Pioneer Square. And then he ended up running the uh, Doc uh, Maynard's Tavern in Pioneer Square. But he had a sense of history and he was a good communicator. And he started inviting the city council people down to take a look at what was going on in Pioneer Square and, and uh, some youth league that I can't name right off the bat, but they were the first ones to put on hard hat helmets and goggles and work their way into the underground city underneath Pioneer Square there and came back alive and reported that it was really cool under there. And the newspapers covered all this and it just led to committees and to the city recognizing that we needed to save what was left. I'm glad they finally did. Thank you. Um, someone is asking, do you think racism was involved in Hamilton's not succeeding up north, but Owen did? Uh, I don't because Owen was black as well. 
he just, you know, he sold it to uh, his manager and, um, you know, the whole story really is a tangled one. Um, uh, the real racism, I think, was not that they bothered Doc Hamilton and sort of drove him out of town. It's that uh, no, no other black entrepreneurs really were running any uh, businesses of note downtown. Seattle's downtown was a white zone. And, uh, you know, as I've written about a lot about maybe in this book a little bit, I'm sure I mentioned it, but uh, in other books I've written, uh, and it kind of still shocks people, but um, from the 1800s on, there were two distinct racially segregated musicians unions, one for the white musicians and one for the black. Oh. And the whites controlled all the lucrative market. They controlled all the theaters downtown. They controlled all the uh, ballrooms. They controlled all the... Uh, uh, the uh, theaters, ballrooms, uh, dance halls uh, for most of downtown. And so that is why, and then the black union, uh, they were able to book their bands into uh, bands, uh, into uh, nightclubs and dance halls and things uh, on the Esler and Jackson, I'm sorry, Jackson, south of there and east of there, which is why the jazz scene in Seattle grew up on South Jackson. Yeah. There also, strangely enough, was a small uh, black oriented uh, business trip along East Madison, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, or actually it was between 18th and probably 23rd. That was uh, the Northern border of the Central District where black businesses also uh, sort of thrived there. But no, the scandal is that black uh, business people weren't allowed to run any businesses downtown in the vast majority of downtown Seattle. Uh, and the musicians union, just to try and cap that off and bring it to some sort of resolution, they did not merge, the white and black musicians unions didn't merge until 1958. Wow. So. Uh, Where was the black and tan? Was that like, later? Yeah, that was like at 12th and uh, Jackson, I guess. 12th and Jackson. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, next question. Spanish Castle? Yes. That was the question. Uh, hey. You want to know something more about the Spanish castle? Well, Spanish castle was uh, one of the first images I showed here. It probably went too by for everybody to have a lot of fun with it, but uh, it's, an, uh, you know, along with Parker's Ballroom up on Aurora, it was probably one of the other most fabled legendary joints because it opened in, like Parker's did in 1930-31 uh, during Prohibition. And uh, it attracted, because it was midway, they called it, it was midway between Seattle and Tacoma. It attracted crowds from both of those towns. Uh, it also had distinctive architecture. It looked like a, a Moorish castle from Spain. Um, it also was one of the ones that uh, booked all the top bands, all the big dance orchestras of the 1930s and 40s. And, and uh, but it's mainly remembered now uh, because it was so pivotal to the rise of the first generation of Northwest rock bands. The uh, first early great uh, rock band from Tacoma, the Whalers, um, played their first dance there in the fall of 59, I think. And then, and Pat O'Day, Seattle's great AM radio DJ of all time, he, uh, he booked that dance for them, and then he basically took over control of the place and for the next uh, half decade or more, uh, booked you know weekly dances down there and all the bands played there, all of them, um, uh, including again, the, the big national stars like Gene Vincent and even Ray Stevens and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and, and uh, all those bands, Paul Rue and the Raiders, Kingsman again. Um, we need that, we need the music back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately, what happened there was because it was out on the highway, uh, there was two incidents, I think, weeks apart from each other, where teenage kids going to an evening dance there, crossing the highway, got run over by cars. And as Pat O'Day told me, it just sort of took the, the uh, bloom off the rose. It just uh, robbed everybody of, of the happy spirit that, uh, that had been going on for so long at all these hundreds of teenage dances. And Pat O'Day got out of the business. And in the end, I think in 1968, they ended up bulldozing that place too. Oh, wow. How about the, um, Thomas is asking about the White River Inn 
and the China peasant on Highway 99? China peasant, I think we mentioned in this book, um, but it is one of the ones, and we do have artifacts from it. Brad and I both have, you know, menus, drink menus, and business cards and things like that. Uh, I think we show a menu in this book. I just didn't include it. Uh, there's a bunch of them, like the ones you mentioned that are sort of scattered out there. They weren't really on, on uh, Highway 99 or they weren't on the Bothell Highway, Lake City Way. So we kind of just had to uh, organize ourselves and couldn't tell all the stories. But it, in this book, we tell the stories of, I think, 65 or 68 roadhouses. But the, like the ones you mentioned there, uh, that could be fodder for volume two. Please repeat the name of the other one. What was it? The White River? The White? Uh, White River Inn. I don't know that. I'll be Googling it. I'll be digging into the archive. Let me write it down. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe this person could uh, send a chat. Um, with some information or another thing in the question answer. That would be fun. Okay, got another one. There's a number of more. Right. Um, this person says, if I wanted to spend a Saturday doing a roadhouse tour, which sites would you recommend that I visit? I know Woody's and Drift On In are still going strong, but how about other spots that might be worth a visit in 2023? That's Maybe. a tough one. Um, Two in the north end of Seattle are, get your pencil out, um, the Shanty Tavern, which I showed a picture of from the 1930s, that's still happening. They have live bands playing there, uh, but they're only open one night a week, Friday nights. And the reason is the owner, bartender, John Spaccarotelli, is 90 years old. He likes to work one night a week. But they, <laughs> they do serve, serve drinks there and they have great bands there. So I'd recommend that, the Shanty Tavern. Uh, a few blocks away from there on uh, 35th Northeast, or is it Northeast 35th? 35th Northeast uh, is the Fiddler's Inn. I did not show that one here because I had to trim things down to fit time-wise. Fiddler's Inn is still there. It started as sort of a log cabin uh, thing in the 1930s. Um, I have an essay all about it, Fiddler's Inn at historylink.org. It's got a really great story. That one still exists. Um, that's the two, two on Aurora and two on uh, Lake City Way that still exist. There's, uh, as I said early, the uh, Brook Lake Inn down by Des Moines uh, is still open, but it doesn't serve booze. It's a rental hall. Heavy metal bands like rent it and hold keggers there basically, but there's no food service or anything, but it's on a lake. It's cool. That's what I can tell you. Um, I think you responded a while ago to another question, but um, Robert is asking, were there any interesting roadhouses between Seattle and Tacoma? You mentioned the one earlier. Yeah, uh, well, technically, I guess Clancy's in the first one that I mentioned that got raided in 1915. It's long gone, but, and then Spanish Castle was between there. Um, I showed that uh, Big Tree Inn, like the second image I showed, which was built inside of a sawed off tree stump, basically. Um, uh, there were more, and there was a ton of these things down by uh, Ponder's Corner outside Tacoma. Uh, I mentioned Jelly Roll Morton, the great uh, boogie woogie piano player of the teens and 20s. He is known to have, uh, after leaving Seattle in 1919 or 1920, he played a bar down there uh, at Ponder's Corner neighborhood. Um, and then the very first image that I showed was uh, the Evergreen Ballroom, which attracted a lot of people from Tacoma, even though it was south of Tacoma. It was uh, near Lacey, so north of Olympia. Um, it's long gone. It burned down about a decade and a half ago, too. Uh, I'm sure there's many more. I hope to learn of them. I'm taking notes. Uh, we'll include them in the volume two of this book if we get to it. I uh, didn't give you a question that was printed up earlier asking for a list of your books. And I told him that we could do that, that I should get it from you because there was a discrepancy about whether you had eight books or 10 books and now you're talking about more. But <laughs> I reminded that person that uh, wrote that, that one of our goals is to help you sell your books. So, yeah, <laughs> so help me with that, okay? Okay. Um, some more questions, we're running out of, of time, but can you go for a little while longer? I can go for a little while longer. I will say that Lost Roadhouses is my ninth book. The 10th book is coming out in a couple months. I'm really proud of it. 
Uh, it's uh, based on 40 years of research. It's the book I intended to do when I began all this in 1978. Uh, I interviewed 400 people. Uh, and what I wanted to do, it's called Stomp and Shout, R&B and the Origins of Northwest Rock. And my goal was to go interview all the people, all the musicians who had hit records out of the Northwest, interview all the top radio DJs, interview the dance hall uh, promoters, interview the audio engineers that worked in all the recording studios that recorded all this, and then quote from them and let them tell their own stories. So uh, it's coming out in a couple months. UW Press is publishing it. It's my first hardback book. I'm excited about that. And uh, in the end, 93 of those people got quoted directly telling the best parts of their stories of how they came into music and made their first record and got their hit record and went on tour and all that good stuff. Maybe we'll sign you up for another presentation later in the year, Pete. It's a deal. There's a lot of us that are interested in that music stuff. I'm um, going to go on with these questions kind of quickly. Someone says, I may have missed this at the beginning, but how did you get the idea to do this book on the roadhouses and what were your best research sources? Well, the sources is easy because um, almost nobody's left alive <laughs> who were <laughs> active during these times. So um, it basically amounted to uh, stumbling across a few people whose you know, dad owned a roadhouse or something like that. And they were able to share photographs or tell us, but mainly it was uh, scouring newspaper archives, both oh. Brad and I, when you know spent uh, a year and a half going through seattle times okay. seattle post intelligence or seattle star town crier all these old newspapers some of which uh, are no longer around and searching 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 so we found a lot of information that way uh, and then you know i had been collecting band photographs forever and some of them happened to be these bands from the 1920s and 30s. And, uh, um, and then once in a while, we would just luck into a, a new source of information. Uh, the thing that ate up the most time was tracking these uh, court cases. You would read about a roadhouse getting busted, and then you'd have to follow it through the next day's newspapers, the next week, the next month, and try and figure out, so what happened here? Who got arrested? Who went to jail? Who went to prison? And uh, who got out of prison and came back and did it again? And uh, we tracked all that, and that makes up <laughs> a good portion of the book. Is no kidding. Repeat, I, of, repeat offenders. <laughs> an anonymous attendee. A lot of these are anonymous. Um, I'm not sure what she was talking about, but she said, "No monument!" Exclamation mark. He was corrupt. Thank you for clarification. Read the original. He, what was that? <laughs> That's regarding Roy Olmstead, the corrupt cop, and I agree. I don't know what the last bit read the original was about, but we apparently agree that we don't need a statue to this guy. Okay, that's good. And um, there was one here. Somebody mentions it. I mean, you already talked about the Spanish castle, but um, this person can remember their parents talking about going there. So that was good. good memory there. Excellent. Um, yeah, you hear that all the time that, that so many people for so many years went dancing there. And, and uh, yeah. the last thing I'll say about Spanish Castle and that comes to mind for me is, you know, it's just a famous fact that uh, young Jimi Hendrix uh, growing up in Seattle when he was, you know, 16 and 17 and 18, that he went to many, many teen dances around town at the YMCA and at some of these uh, dance halls on East Madison Street that I mentioned. He also made his way down evidently a few times to the Spanish castle. And in 1968, on his second album, when he was already a rock star, he included a song called Spanish Castle Magic that a lot of us think was his sort of nostalgic oh, super. tip of the hat. I that, to, yep. I hope the person is still here and heard that from you. Uh, Marilyn says she believes Yesler had another sawmill on Lake Washington east of the UW parking lot. It's true. It was right next to uh, Laurelhurst, right there by the mm, Horticultural Center, I guess, right in there, uh, a little bit further even east from that. And it was actually going to be a town called Yesler. So oh. that lasted for quite a while, and they ended up developing into, I guess, part of Laurelhurst at this time. 
Yeah. In those early days, where did the capital come from to build everything? Did banks loan the money? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know when the first bank came here, but, uh, uh, you know, Yesler's first sawmill down at First and Yesler downtown there uh, was the largest industry on Puget Sound at the time and employed, you know, hundreds of men. Some of them were uh, Duwamish uh, Muckleshoot Indians and some were new arrivals. Some were sailors who jumped ship when they got here. And, and uh, I think almost all the early pioneers, guys with names like Bell from Belltown, Mercer, uh, all those guys uh, put in some work with the Esslers mill getting it started. And I think he accumulated wealth from that. And I don't know. And then Doc Maynard opened a grocery store in addition to being the doctor. And, uh, you know, a lot of these guys had two or three different careers in early Seattle in the first decade. And, and I think they accumulated some wealth that way. But I don't have an exact answer. Sorry. Thank you. There's just three more and then we'll let you close up. Um, this anonymous person says, not to make you cry, but with Seattle so to this day involved in music and theater, why do you believe so many houses of culture haven't been saved? For instance, the great theater downtown, just a bit of the front left. She's sobbing. Yeah, me too. Uh, the easiest answer is arts organizations, you know, orchestras. Uh, they didn't own the real estate, um, you know? They seem to, to always be renting. These, a lot of these roadhouse guys, uh, or at least saloon owners downtown, they were, as they do today, they don't own the building. They don't have any say. Um, and as property values increase, they get squeezed out and, you know, it is a cry and shame. We've lost some good ones. And then you have others that, you know, <laughs> get turned into one of the, you know, an example like, uh, uh, you know, one of the grandest theaters ever in Seattle gets turned into a Nike shoe store. You know, oh. so we didn't get to vote on that. It just happened. So uh, crying helps. Yeah. Pete, were any, many of the road houses um, did part brothels? Yes. I mentioned that hopefully a couple times early on. Uh, there was a difference uh, that we have noticed, Brad Holden and I, we have noticed that um, the roadhouses over on the old Seattle Everett Highway, Highway 99, Lakes, uh, Aurora, were often associated with prostitution. Uh -huh. They either had it upstairs, in the back, or a few of them, cleverly enough, uh, would have their food, their dancing, their drinking in the main uh, venue on one side of the highway, and then they would have a series of small cabins stuck in the wood on the other side uh, of the highway, so they ran it that way. Uh, but we have noticed that more of these places got caught uh, having running uh, brothels than did the ones over here on the Bothell Highway, Lake City Way. Okay. Um, Andrea's thanking you. I mean, several thanks coming in. Congrats on all the books. It's the toughest of professions. Thanks <laughs> for the great presentation. Thank you very much. I appreciate everybody hanging out and asking some good questions and, and uh, look forward to my upcoming book. It's the most exciting one I've done. Two more quick questions and I've got to throw them in since they just okay. came in. Want to know if you have any books on Playland or other amusement parks? No, we're aware of Playland because um, it's right there on Aurora. Um, I just, uh, I have dear friends who are specialists in that, who collect that stuff and are even historians of it. Uh, I don't know that they're ready to do a book yet, but uh, uh, that could happen because they have so many good photographs and so many good stories that uh, I'll give them a nudge and say, uh, and get going on that. And the fun one to close with, how did cars get fuel to get to roadhouses on the new road? <laughs> well, uh, there were early versions of gas stations. There is one old Seattle uh, 
story that I think has been disproven, but for a long time, people claimed that the America's first gas station was in Seattle. And it just seemed sort of unlikely since there were cars in Chicago and Detroit and probably New York before here. But I think that's been sorted out enough that, uh, that uh, we know that it was a very early one that not only uh, supplied fuel, but you know, had other supplies that you need for your car, whether it was tires or oil or what, I don't know. But to my recollection, and I'm not an auto historian, but I think that was located on today's East Lake Avenue. Okay. Um, any organized crime come in from the East during that time? Uh, see, there were some minor associations with it by the 1950s or so, but uh, it is notable that uh, our buddy Roy Olmsted, the corrupt cop who led the gang here, uh, did not run it uh, Chicago or Detroit or Las Vegas style. He didn't allow his gang members to carry guns. And uh, I think the most they ever did was possibly, you know, beat some people up or something, but they, uh, they just weren't into, uh, you know, extreme violence and, uh, and they did not, to our knowledge, have connections with the with the big gangs from back east. So uh, it was a little more civilized here. All right. Well, we'll close it up with Pat says, thank you, Peter. And I thank you, Peter. And I'm sure everyone would like to say that to you. And we wish you well with your writing. And we do hope to see you again. Let's so do that. Thank, thank you, everybody. Yeah. All thank right. Thank you, everybody, for being here and all your questions. It makes for a very good wrap up. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you.